Welcome to Massey Dialogues. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for another episode of the Massey Dialogues. I first want to acknowledge that Massey is built on the indigenous lands, the lands of the Yonwenda, the Seneca, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Today, the episode is about caring. It's about sibling relationships and the way in which we care for people with disability and the impact that it has on public policy and the way in which we should frame the support that is needed. And I'm very grateful to Maddie DeWells, to whom I'm going to pass the mic, for coming forward with this subject, Maddie. Thank you so much, Natalie, um, and thank you to Liv, Helen, and Terrence for being here today. Um, so um, as, uh, as Natalie mentioned, uh, today's panel and dialogue is in honor of National Siblings Day, um, which is on April 10th, and we're going to hear a rich discussion on sibling relationships and the intersections of disability caregiving and policy. Um, and here with us today, we have senior fellow Liv Mendelssohn. Um, as well as Helen Reese, a caregiver co-founder of Siblings Canada, which was formerly known as the Sibling Collaborative, as well as Terence Ho, who is an advocate caregiver and also connected to Siblings Canada. Um, so I'd like to begin with um, a few introductions of our panelists today. Um, so beginning with, with Terence. So Terence is a son, brother, and caregiver. He's worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors where he's developed his ability to advocate tirelessly for the greater good as a strategist, facilitator, and community builder. One of his biggest influences is his younger brother who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Terence has come to appreciate the unique needs of patients and caregivers, having cared for his brother for almost 30 years. Currently, he is the head of partner success at Braze Mobility, a company that developed the, the world's first blind spot sensors for wheelchairs. So welcome, Terence. It's so great to have you um, and really looking forward to, to today's discussion. Um, so uh, moving now to introducing Helen. Um, so Helen Reese, uh, all of her life, Helen knew that one day she would be responsible for her brother Paul's care. When that day arrived, it was early, unexpected, and fast. Through trials and tribulations, and also honest self-reflection and a deep commitment to one another, Helen and Paul found a way to support each other. Uh, Helen is also the co-founder of Siblings Canada. Siblings Canada is an initiative of the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence, or CCCE, a new nonprofit dedicated to supporting caregivers and care providers. CCCE and Siblings Canada share a vision where all caregivers, including siblings, are valued and supported. So welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, now I'm uh, just going to introduce Liv. So Liv Mendelson is the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence. Over the course of her career, Liv has founded and helmed several organizations in the disability and caregiving space, including the Wagner Green Centre for Accessibility and Inclusion at the Miles Nadal JCC, where she led for seven years, and the Real Abilities Toronto Film Festival, where she served as founding artistic director. Liv also serves as the Vice Chair of the City of Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, in 2019, she was recognized as a recipient of the City of Toronto Equity Award and is a Senior Fellow at Massey College. Liv was a young carer, has been a lifelong caregiver, and has lived experiences of disability. Welcome, Liv. Um, it's so great to have you here, and welcome again to, to Helen and Terrence. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, so moving on uh, a little bit to some questions um, for, for today, uh, Terence, um, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, about the work that, that, that you're involved in um, as, well as, as well as yourself? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Terence and I've been a caregiver to my younger brother for yeah, almost 30 years now. Um, growing up, uh, my brother was diagnosed when he was six. So yeah, at an early age, I was given a lot of the responsibilities to uh, just 
care for my brother. Um, and so from that experience growing up has influenced me in a lot of the uh, roles I've taken on, um, not only for my family, but also in the places I work. Um, and so, yeah, so currently I am the head of partner success at Braze Mobility, where, yeah, we developed the first blind spot sensors for wheelchairs. Um, and because my brother for most of his life, he has used either a manual or power wheelchair. So I've seen the challenges that he's faced um, in in the space of just mobility itself. Um, and so, yeah, this is a little bit of what I do and who I am. Thank you so much, Terrence. Um, I, it, was, it was so clear, you know, how how care and um, uh, it really flows throughout not only not only your your life but also your your work. Um, so so thank you so much for 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 that introduction um, and also telling um, telling us about your experiences, uh, your your brother as well as as well as your work. Um, so moving on to to Helen. So Helen, could you tell us a little bit more about um, your uh, your work, uh, specifically your your position at, at Siblings Canada. Sure. So um, I, I've been caring for my brother Paul with my husband for about seven years now. Um, time has really flown by. And when I first started caring, when our parents passed away, I was really shocked that there was nothing out there for me. There was no... Um, supports there was no one who could give me any guidance and so in 2018 with becky rossi i co-founded uh, the sibling collaborative which is now siblings canada we really wanted to make sure that canadian siblings of people with disabilities um, that there there was some recognition of their their role that they had um, some kind of support and that you know honestly that our role is really valued um, so uh, that's what we've been working on for the last five years. Um, prior to that, uh, like Terrence, a lot of my work has involved um, some sort of flow from caring, um, because I think as a sibling, it's just who you are a lot of times and, uh, you know, concern for people who are somehow vulnerable um, has always been reflected in the work that I've done throughout my career. Thank you, Helen. Um, that was thank you so much for for sharing about um, about Siblings Canada, um, about about your brother Paul, um, as well as as navigating um, not not having very much support, and then and then um, that leading to to your work uh, with with Becky Rossi and and recognition and and support as well as as well as the role of care. Um, I think that 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 really came out out for for me and and uh, hearing more about about your work. So thank you so much. Um, and and now moving on to to Liv. So, Liv, um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about um, about your role as executive director at the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence, um, as well as 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 care within within your life and work? Sure. Um, the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence is a uh, uh, embedded within and an arm of the Azrieli Foundation, which is a philanthropic foundation here in Canada that has been really focused on the needs of people with disabilities and the people who need to access care and the web of support around them. So we are a new center uh, launching in May and our focus is on caregiving across the lifespan. Um, and I have seen that uh, journey reflected in my own life. Uh, I was born into a role uh, as a, a caregiver for a grandparent. Uh, I uh, continued uh, on the caregiving pathway when my own um, children were born and uh, both of my children are neurodiverse. And um, I uh, now care um, for uh, parents as well. So we know that caregiving happens at a variety of ages and stages. And we know that uh, sibling caregivers uh, demographically uh, are, are becoming more and more the norm uh, as our population ages and they have particular needs that we want to make sure are met in terms of supports um, in terms of uh, creating a, a network for them um, and in terms of public policy thank you so much Liv um, 
I really liked um, how you talked about uh, the, the ways in which care happens across the lifespan at a variety of ages and stages um, and, and, um, and how, how care and caregiving really does um, become a journey across, across the lifespan. And, and thank you also for sharing some of your work at uh, the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence. Um, that uh, that all sounds so so excellent and so great. Um, so so thank you all for those uh, for 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 telling us more about your work and for and for those great introductions. Um, now, uh, Liv, you mentioned some um, about some of the supports um, that siblings uh, that siblings may 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 need, um, and you also mentioned the uh, the intersections of caregiving um, support and and policy. Could you speak a little bit more about about that, so some of the supports of, of sibling caregivers and how that then connects more broadly to policy. I think um, Helen's experience um, that she just described speaks volumes. Um, siblings uh, often are in a in a care transition. Um, often uh, parents have been primary caregivers uh, for someone with a disability, someone accessing care. And um, caregiving organizations don't always know um, how to support siblings um, in, the, in the ways that will be most helpful. And um, we know from surveys that have been done with siblings um, that they often feel quite left out of the care team. They feel unrecognized by healthcare teams, but also by those creating supports. Um, and siblings need their own uh, places and spaces to share information and get support. Uh, but as they take on uh, more responsibility, including in many cases, uh, financial responsibility uh, for their sibling and the responsibility of helping that sibling to um, live a meaningful life and to access all the choices and rights available to them, uh, there is a complex financial, legal and emotional uh, path uh, that is a little bit uncharted. So uh, we are here to advocate for siblings uh, within networks of uh, caregiving organizations uh, to advocate for more research to be done on the needs of siblings and to share uh, knowledge and information, and also to look at public policy needs um, around uh, siblings specific needs for financial support and for recognition of the um, unpaid work that they are doing uh, to make sure that their sibling has uh, a full and uh, fulfilling life. Thank you so much, Liv. Um, what you said about care transitions, especially in the context of, of being a sibling caregiver, um, uh, was was uh, was was very uh, very powerful, and I think really does speak to um, to the ways in which sibling care caregivers may find them, themselves in, in that kind of in between space of, of of being a sibling, but also being being a caregiver and having having uh, many um, responsibilities. Um, that uh, that they need uh, to to be supported with. So so thank you so much. And um, following what what you said, um, Liv, Terence, would you would you like to speak a little bit more um, to your experiences as as a sibling caregiver, um, and um, and and the sort of supports that maybe you have or or have not uh, received? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So being a sibling caregiver growing up is something that no one like, taught me how to do. And I just had to kind of find my own way. Um, so I, the only place I remember receiving support when I was young um, was at Bloorview, where they provided a counselor for me for maybe a few sessions. But then beyond that, there was no one else that I could really turn to for some guidance around uh, what does it mean to be a, a sibling caregiver? And uh, why is my brother's like a condition changing? Um, so no one really was able to uh, talk to me about it. So I had to really figure it out on my own growing up, which made it a little bit difficult. However, uh, the the bright side to it is that I did gain a lot of skill sets. Um, and as kind of what Liv mentioned, where I was able to take that skill set that I learned from advocating care for a brother, then into, say, supporting my grandfather uh, as he was going through um, his health challenges. And then our mom... Uh, who was uh, diagnosed with lung cancer two years ago and died recently. Um, and all those skill sets that I had to learn on my own um, from 
uh, caring and advocating for my brother growing up has really helped me in many other ways to support other family members and also advising uh, friends and, and other people too. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that that's been my experience growing up. Uh, I, I was very happy when I saw what Helen um, uh, co-founded a couple of years back and for me to have camaraderie with other siblings a couple of years ago, uh, which gave me a space to um, just feel supported and to be seen and be heard by other siblings that may be going through something similar. So that was extremely uh, valuable. Um, but beyond that, uh, there hasn't been any like focused support for siblings directly until until recently. Thank you, thank you so much, Terrence. Um, I, you know that that uh, that that question that you posed, you know, like about what does it mean to be a sibling caregiver, and kind of grappling with that at, at, at a very young age, um, I, I think is I think is 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 so so profound and and I, I think too I really appreciate what you what you mentioned about um, about advocacy and the ways in which um, as a young uh, as a young caregiver and kind of uh, learning not only about kind of the almost like the technicalities of care but also kind of the nuances of care what that feels like what that means in the context of a sibling relationship um and then and then that kind of forming into advocacy for your other family members um i think was something that uh, that really stuck uh, stuck out to me from from what you were saying um and and that's i and and, and that's a such excellent um it's great the work that that Helen and Becky um, and and Liv, and Liv are doing in terms of the uh, the, the sibling uh, siblings Canada uh, and and providing providing that support um, where uh, where where it was uh, where it was where it was where it was missing. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you, Terence. That was that was uh, that was great. And and, and um, following following what you just uh, said, Terence. Uh, moving to to Helen, um, Helen, would you like to speak a little bit? Um, about some of those, um, what Terence was saying about some of those missing supports, or your experiences as as a, as a sibling caregiver with uh, with your brother. Sure, um, I really liked what Terence said about finding your own way, and I think that's what a lot of siblings. Um, have always done and continue to do uh, because we don't really know it any other way. And uh, I never actually thought of myself as a caregiver. It's only um, very recently where I think I, it's very clear to me that that is my role. And um, so sometimes if you don't have a name or a label for what it is that you're doing, it's actually really hard to find what you need. Um, I think one of the things that uh we don't recognize is that when we do transition to a caring role whatever that looks like um, we're often entering into a uh, time for our siblings that is that is quite complicated um, and our, our as our siblings age i mean we're usually entering into that role when our siblings are older or we hope that the that that's when that's happening and so there's a lot of um, physical um, psychological changes uh, that we need to to deal with uh, that perhaps our parents never had to deal with so in terms of supports um, uh, first of all recognizing that for many of us this is a new and really kind of alarming transition into being a caregiver, um, help with under system navigation, being able to learn what our parents might have had 40, 30, 40, or 50 years to learn, we need to learn overnight. Um, and then as our siblings needs change um, while they're aging, or something perhaps traumatic has happened, uh, that there we need to know where to find those kind of resources that they might need so perhaps that's like personal care support or um, um, supported independent living or transition to different housing situation and then i have to also say there's the psychological uh, support that's needed not um, not only for us um, 
you know, taking on a new role, but also for our siblings who perhaps they are grieving or um, they're, they're traumatized in some way um, if they've had to move home. So there's so many complexities around um, sibling caregiving that I don't think is recognized. We really are not uh, simply stepping into our parents' shoes. It's, um, it's much more complicated. And so the supports around siblings for sibling caregiving need to be uh, quite robust to help us through uh, this very difficult time. And I think also it's worth mentioning that um, there's a lot a longevity to our caregiving role. A lot of times, uh, if you're a caregiver, let's say of somebody with a chronic illness, there's a an end to your caregiving role that's perhaps in the short to medium term. But sibling caregiving is it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, and so. Um, it's it's a uh, really really as I say a very complicated journey. Thank you so much, you. Helen, um, for for that incredibly thoughtful response and a couple of things that um, you know are, are really standing out um, for me is 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 that complexity of care that you that you uh, that you really that you really um, adequately and, and beautifully brought attention to. And, and I think too, you know, within that year, you're, you've revealed the parent-child relationship, but also the, um, the relationship between siblings or, or children and children relationships and, and, and what being a sibling caregiver um, may, may do and, and, and how there are so many uh, shifts within, within that relationship in, in the context of, of caregiving. And I think too, what you said about um, system navigation um, and finding finding your own way I, th I think it was, it was also so so important um, and I, you know something that I, I kind of think or thought about when you mentioned system navigation is is how systems and structures really um, can in a sense structure how we care but also how access to care may or may not um, be given or or be um, and so I, I think that um, I think that that those were those were a couple of um, of points that that really struck uh, stuck out to me, and also um, the what you said at the beginning about how it's hard to find what you need when you don't really know what you're doing. I, I thought, yeah, like like absolutely, you know, you're it, it, there's it's so complex, not only the systems and the structures, but also the relationships that you're trying to navigate, that you're trying to cultivate, um, and um, and 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 strengthen. Um, so so thank you so much. Um, Helen, uh, for uh, for for your response and your um, and your and your thoughtful insights. Um, so, I guess moving on a little bit um, from, uh, or I guess kind of staying also with what Helen was talking about in terms of um, in terms of uh, of system navigation or of uh, of supports in, in that sense. Um, Liv, in, in, in your work, um, have there been, have you, have you discussed or, th or um, talked about ways in which uh, young carers or sibling caregivers may, um, may, may be able to navigate systems or um, are there any tools or supports for, I guess, navigating the systems and the structures that, that, um, that do give those, uh, those supports or, or are there ways of kind of finding them or making that navigation process easier or a little bit more or a little bit less daunting yeah there there are starting to be more and more certainly um, for young carers um, who may not be siblings but maybe um, children or grandchildren um, there are organizations that that have been doing great work um, including uh, the voices of of young carers um, in terms of siblings specifically uh, we're actually working on gathering supports that exist across the country um, we're going to be holding a conference um, in 2023, uh, but uh, the supports that siblings need uh, when they're young and part of that family system uh, in the home um, are, are uh, there and they, they certainly need support and especially um, emotional support and their own time to process um, their role as a sibling care. But we're seeing uh, a lot of need um, as um, the person in the family who accesses care 
uh, ages and siblings are are taking on um, again the financial um, support, the emotional support, housing support, uh, all of those roles, and and may not uh, legal legal uh, power of attorney, all of those roles, and may not have. Um, the kind of support they need. And um, I think Helen um, can speak uh, to a survey, uh, a recent survey of siblings across Canada and um, where they're uh, aware of real gaps in supports as they navigate that transition. Yes. Yes. Um, what Liv was saying about uh, sibling supports uh, is is really what we're working on with Siblings Canada. And this is one of the beauties of us um, becoming part of or becoming an initiative of CCCE. We now have more uh, wind beneath our wings to build those kind of supports. Um, we're working right now on a project um, uh, where, where the grantor was um, ESDC, the Government of Canada, to look at how siblings can um, financially steward um, the well-being of their, their brothers and sisters. So we're building some supports there to look at um, um, how we can take a look at that financial aspect. And as part of that project, we did a survey, as, as Liv, Liv mentioned, and so we learned what some of the top areas of needed support are as identified by siblings. And very interestingly, the one, first thing that siblings ask for what they want the most support in is how to advocate for their brother and sister. And I think that speaks to that system navigation piece and having to, you know, suddenly jump into navigating this enormous bureaucracy that surrounds people with disabilities in Canada and how do we uh, get, get through that so that our brothers and sisters can live their best life. Um, other areas uh, where siblings uh, want support are around mental health um, and the Siblings Canada does have a very close relationship with the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health and uh, so we are doing research and we have a number of supports um, that we do in partnership with CAMH and again that financial piece so those are just some areas that are that we are working on right now um, and uh, with CCCE we'll really be able to fly um, in building building what siblings in Canada need Oh, fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Helen and Liv. Um, the, and, you know, what, in just hearing that, um, that uh, conversation uh, about, um, and, and the, the really crucial link, I think, between advocacy um, and system navigation, uh, I, I think, I think is, is so important. And, and Terrence, um, would you like to um, talk a little bit about some of the uh, services that you've received um, that, that have helped you kind of on that uh, system navigation? advocacy journey, as well as your, your journey as a, as a sibling caregiver? Yeah, sure. So in terms of advocacy, I want to say that a lot of it was just kind of like learning on the go, um, because not only is it navigating the bureaucracy, but it's also like learning the lingo of like, ah, oh, like what's the lingo I, I need to like say to someone. Um, so then to like activate certain services for my sibling. Um, so there wasn't a place to go to learn. And it's, so it's more just around speaking with the court care coordinators and speaking with nurses and speaking with counselors and, and just really learning on the fly. Um, and in terms of services, even though I mentioned that I didn't get direct services as a sibling, um, I did receive more services as a caregiver, say to my mom. Um, so I was able to like receive services from the Ontario Caregivers Association or even Circle of Care where I was able to receive, be it grief counseling and uh, other types of support for myself and also for my brother um, through organizations like those. So th those have been very useful in teaching me and directing me to services that could help me as a caregiver and also to help my loved one. Um, yeah, so that, that's been valuable. 
Oh, that, that's great. Thank you, Terrence. And and yeah, what, what you mentioned too about kind of you, it's, it, you kind of have to balance balance so many worlds. You know, there's the there's the language of bureaucracy. There's understanding these policies, these documents, and then there's the lingo or talking to doctors and talking to nurses. Um, but uh, but also kind of seeing the ways in which that that supports you as a caregiver, as well as as well as um, as well as uh, your your sibling and and your and your in your family and in in general. Um, it's uh, it, 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 it kind of returns me a little bit to what Helen was saying about about the complexity of care and how care really is this this web you know that 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 start that it's structural it's systemic but it also it, it goes down into institutions and into people's lives and and into into heart into their hearts and, and, and the ways in which we we live interact with and, and care for each other um, so so thank you so much um, and um, Helen, I'm I, I'm wondering if you'd like to speak a little bit more um, to uh, to in terms of of you mentioned mental mental health and the mental health of caregivers. Would you like to speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, just very briefly, I wanted to build on what uh, Terrence was saying. Um, you know, it's just really great to hear that uh, Terrence was seeking supports uh, not only for his loved ones but for himself and I think that's something that uh, siblings need to be um, really proactive around because uh, you know the loss of a parent is in itself um, a very difficult moment in life and then this transition to a new role a new relationship with your brother or sister um, is really challenging uh, I, i'm be perfectly honest in that it's taken me a lot of time and a lot of um, uh, introspection and uh, support from let's say counselors and uh, mindful self-compassion to to really understand what had happened to me and to my life when when this transition happened for me. So uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health has um, been paying a lot of attention to sibling mental health. And so we even um, have uh, built a program, acceptance and commitment training therapy for siblings and um, have offered that in the past with much success and we'll be offering it moving forward. So it's just a really important consideration is our own mental health and it's often quite neglected. Thank you, Helen. Um, and 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 absolutely, you know, I, I think that um, that uh, that that care for um, and, and what you mentioned too about how there are so many transitions going on. You know, there, there's there's grief, there's the loss of a parent, um, and these difficult movements in life. I, I think absolutely call for um, that um, that that uh, that care for for um, not only. The people around us, but also, but also, uh, kind of just acknowledging that that all of these transitions are are mon monumental and 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 can be so so and are very very difficult. So so thank you so much. Um, and it's all what you what you and Terrence also um, were mentioning, and it made me think of as well. You know the the ways in which um, parenthood kind of flow, flows throughout um, this uh, this conversation as well, uh, in terms of both the loss of a parent, but also how as, as siblings, you know, very often you are connected to, to a parent and, and the loss of a parent, what that, what that does, not only in terms of your own relationship, but in terms of your, your relationships with that parent or that parent who has passed. Um, so just, yeah, lots of, lots of such complex, but, but crucial and, um, and really careful thoughts. So thank you all so much. Um, and, um, I guess thinking a little bit more along the lines of uh, of care, of um, of caring for each other, um, it's also it, it's bringing to mind sort of the con the concept of, of of interdependence or what it means to to be. Uh, to be caring for, um, to be caring for others, um, not uh, like together or in a in a very interdependent kind of way. Um, and so, for for our panelists, and maybe Liv, uh, I can start with you. How might um, how might caregiving be understood in in the context of of interdependence? I think interdependence uh, is a really great frame for looking at the kind of web of care that we 
we all will be providing at some point in our lives and we all will need at some point in our lives. Uh, and I think there has been a, a long focus on independence, independent living skills, helping people to become independent. And um, I think there's been a shift recently to really look at what supports uh, does a family need? How can we center a whole family um, in, in our system of care? And when we look through a frame of interdependence, we, we aren't just um, placing uh, responsibility on an individual sibling caregiver or parent caregiver, uh, but really looking at what is our responsibility to each other uh, as a society through um, uh, what kind of supports we provide through public policy, uh, what kind of supports the organizations that we build um, to, you know, be the backbone and the infrastructure of our society support. Uh, so interdependence, I think, is a is a frame that we're seeing more and more, um, and it also allows for us to to measure um, and and focus on uh, things like mental health and not just is someone housed and clothed, but how is the whole family surviving and thriving. And how is the person accessing care, as Helen said, living their best life? Um, because we want that for the person who who is accessing care. We also want that for the caregiver, uh, for the sibling, for the parent. We want everyone to have the supports that they need uh, to be able to make the choices to live their their very best life. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liv. Um, I really, I really like, you know, how, um, how you, how you talked a little bit about that, that shift from sort of being, um, or from that focus on, on, on independence towards how can we center, for example, the family or how can care um, be broadened towards a kind of a more holistic um, understanding of, of what it means to really care for each other and what that means on societal and structural levels, um, as well as within the family as well as in terms of, of mental health and 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 the uh, the question of living of living one's best life and in 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 all ways that that may mean uh, as well as having the supports um, around to to nurture that so thank you so much um, and uh, I guess following following what what Liv said about interdependence Terence would would you like to talk a little bit about um, either if there was something that that Liv said that you'd like to talk about in terms of um, kind of broadening um, notions of care and how we care for each other or or how you sort of relate to the context of or the concept of interdependence um, in in your own experiences sure yeah what I really appreciated um, over the last few years as I was caring for both my mom and my brother was when the Lynn, which is the local health integration network, um, their coordinators, after talking through all the things that either my mom needed or my brother needed, their next question was, well, what do you need? And at first I was kind of like, whoa, like, why are you asking me that? Um, but then for them to like really put attention to me and say, no, we really need to make sure that you don't burn out in the caregiving process. So we can offer you all these different things um, and are you open to them? And when I heard that, uh, it really touched me because I really felt supported as a sibling caregiver. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I definitely feel that uh, I really feel that there's a great opportunity here for more service providers to also ask that as a question to uh, the sibling caregiver, um, even though, because not all sibling caregivers may be at the forefront of the advocacy, uh, but at least as part of the service providers, like, um, like ask of what the family needs. Uh, I think that's like a great opportunity there. And because I really felt the impact of, of that. Terrence, that happened for us too. Uh, the Lynn did such a good job of saying, um, what do you need? How can you be um, strong and stay well during this? So yes, it was much appreciated. Thank you, Terrence, and thank you, Helen. That, that's such a great example of, 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 of the Lynn and, and the ways in which I think um, uh, 
I think it exemplifies, you know, interdependence and care for care, as well as the the circular nature, or 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 kind of more, or how how care really is a circle and the circle of care and caring for each other. Um, Helen, I don't know if you wanted to um, to speak maybe a little bit more about um, about your experiences either with Lynn, with uh, Lynn L A uh, L I H N or um, uh, how the concept of interdependence has has um, has appeared in in your life and experiences. Hmm. I think, um, you know, my brother really does care for me. Um, he cares for me deeply. And uh, even in so much as every day, bringing me a cup of tea at about 3.30. And that just makes me feel uh, so cared for and so, so good. And I think it's just really um, important to recognize that, you know, people with disabilities are not only recipients of care, but they are also and uh, have an enormous role to play in providing care. And, uh, you know, my brother and I maybe not always um, saw eye to eye and, uh, but through our, you know, going through a traumatic experience of losing our parents has really bonded us. And you know, Paul is my connection to my family history. And he, he is my, my roots and my grounding. So um, I need him as much as he needs me. Um, plus he's super hilarious and just really fun to be around. Um, we, he's supported by an organization that has done really well in um, uh, helping him through um, this time in his life. And I think because they've done a good job, that means that it's been easier for me too. And I think that's where um, Sibling Canada's focus on building capacity of service providing organizations and, and some of the things that Liv was saying is so important. We need a service providing organizations to uh, do a good job for people with disabilities when um, their parents are no longer providing care uh, so that siblings can also do a good job um, in providing care. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, and, and thank you as well for, um, for talking about, uh, uh, about your brother and, and, and such, such beautiful ways and, 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 and talking about the ways in which care can mean and appear in so many different ways in, in our lives and in our relationships. So, so thank you so much. And um, following what, what you said, Terrence, I, I'm wondering if you um, had any, any thoughts specifically surrounding interdependence and, um, and kind of those more um, close or intimate relationships with, uh, with family and friends. Yeah, uh, I, I noticed that family does want to like, participate too in one way, shape or form. And uh, the question around like, how do we engage our family and friends um, to also support us and, and uh, our loved ones. Um, so, uh, one program that actually took, and it was really thanks to Helen, was through like the plant, the Plan Institute, where I got to learn like network facilitation and like building a network support for my brother, and really then engaging um, his closest friends and our family to also be part of my brother's support. So then, I'm I won't be the only one that is the primary advocate. Um, so other people in his network. That also care and love him and by the way my brother's name is torrance so terrence and torrance uh so that we all uh, come together to really support him um and yeah I, I really see the value in that um uh and i also see like some gaps in terms of uh where uh, i would be sort of the bridge between say the lynn and then the to say my family and all our family friends that want to support torrance seems to be also an opportunity here um, where like there's a bridge, a person that plays that bridge role in like connecting my brother to both the you know, like uh, like care support, professional care support, and then also from like the familial and friends care support. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Terrence. And I, I, I think 
you know what what you said about about gaps and and sort of that um, that opportunity here for, for for bridging support. You know, through the throughout this conversation with with you, Helen, and and Liv, um, it it makes me really feel that you know the the Canadian Center for Caregiving Excellence as well as Siblings Canada is so crucial and so integral to into that bridging that bridging support and um, and listening to to young carers to to caregivers um, to to sibling caregivers and and really strengthening and and building that bridge together so um, thank you all so 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 much I I'd love to um, if there are any questions from the uh, from the audience um, that we have if we'd like to address some of those together now um, uh, that would be great um, so here's one I'll read out loud uh, from Inez um, would there would there be any suggestion to parents that would have made it easier for you as siblings that's so hard and I've, I've got that I've had that question a few times and um, I feel so sorry when that question's asked and how I respond is always with much caution because, you know, parents just have a lot on their plate and they're doing the best that they can with what they have. I know my parents certainly did. And, you know, just like siblings, it's probably not a lot. So I think um, I can speak for myself in that uh, my parents did the best that they could. And, uh, I, I have nothing to say about what they should or should not have done. Um, I know there's a lot of talk around future planning and I, I feel like that's a real albatross that parents of people with disabilities have to care, carry around um, for a long time. Uh, it is important, but you know, the pl plans my parents had uh, for my brother have not really come true in it, any way, shape or form because I have my life and I have my ideas. And so we've built things around me and my husband um, and Paul. So I don't, I, I answer, I'm not going to answer that question <laughs> very um, in a lot of detail because I really just want to say that uh, you're doing your best and that's all really that you can do. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, Liv, do you have any any thoughts uh, specifically in terms of parents and, and support? I think, you know, um, Helen, I so appreciate as a parent <laughs> and as a parent watching that sibling relationship unfold, uh, I'm so mindful um, that my role is to, to support both of my children um, and to support them in their relationship. And um, yes, there's planning to do. Um, I think the, the biggest difference um, and the biggest learning I've had from talking to adult siblings um, has been about opening that communication around how, not what plans are gonna be for the future, but that we're gonna do it together, that the lines of communication are open and that there, there, um, there aren't um, big family um, secrets or, or, or on the other, um, uh, side of things, uh, it's not something taboo to talk about, that um, we're all in this, again, to create the best lives for each of us individually and together as a family, um, and that we all have a role in supporting each other. Um, so really, I'm mindful of trying to open up that space. And that's also something that I think um, parents need support to do. Um, those are Sometimes, uh, you know, parenting of all kinds is is rife with um, with guilt and uh, emotion, um, and so having those opportunities, I think, also to learn from adult siblings, not the do's and don'ts, um, Helen, because I think you're right; everyone is doing the best uh, that they have. But what kind of frameworks will best support um, both or all siblings going into the future? Um, Terence, I know. Um, You've also had a lot of experience in this area. I'd love to hear from you on, on your thoughts for parents. Well, sim similar to Helen, where I guess like our mom didn't do much planning. Um, uh, she, you know, her, her, her death from lung cancer was kind of unexpected to all of us. So I don't think even she anticipated it. So we never as a family really talked too much about like planning when our mom is no longer here with 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 my brother Torrance and I, um, but 
I think she, um, having me being by her side, supporting my brother uh, throughout all of my brother's life, she just trusted me that I have his best interests in mind. And um, so really like her planning was, Terrence, I trust you uh, and here you go. Um, so it, it, it does feel like a lot of pressure um, and there are difficult days of, again, trying to figure things out. So if, if parents, like, like Liv said, um, even uh, having some support for parents and um, like educating in terms of like how to have conversations with uh, the family around planning uh, could help a lot. Um, yeah, just because even though my mom and I, we've talked about kind of like planning for her will and all that kind of stuff, but beyond that, like we didn't talk more beyond uh, how to ensure care for my brother Torrance and really she just trusted my judgment and, and advocacy for him. So I think any form of education that could help ease the conversation would, would be very helpful. Um, yeah. And I also noticed too, I think. Uh, maybe culturally, and may, maybe I'm wrong about this, like even like in, in the Chinese culture, uh, 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 some a lot of stigma around disability and and even like planning for death. So having those two conversations is really difficult. <laughs> um, so even educating uh, in, in, with that context in mind could be very valuable too for, for siblings and also for parents. I just wanted to mention that um, uh, uh, the Sib Siblings Canada will be doing a webcast with Partners for Planning um, at the end of April, specifically on this topic, on communicating with parents. And we've also produced a guidebook, which is on our uh, website, I believe. And um, so, you know, communicating is something that Siblings Canada is interested in trying to smooth out and foster between parents and siblings. That's awesome. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and thank you for, for, uh, for letting us know about, about the webcast. And thank you, Liv and, and Terrence and Helen for, for those wonderful, um, wonderful thoughts. You know, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, planning, you know, it, it can be so hard and, and life is, life is so messy, so unexpected. And, and you're, you're you're never expected for for or sorry you're never expecting really the unexpected but i think that as you were mentioning you know having these kind of frameworks these guides in place um is 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 one way that i think going back to interdependence it's one way that that we are caring for each other um and that that uh, that that care is 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 projected and and shared um so thank you all so much. Um, and um, I'm, I was, are there any other um, questions from, from the audience? We have a question here from Pooja. Um, how can employers better support caregivers? It's a great question, thank you. Um, Liv, would you like to, to start us off with this one? Sure, and I, and I wanna um, share that McMaster University and um, Carers Canada, uh, which is a, an initiative from the Canadian Home Care Association have been doing some great work on this, and uh, you can you can follow their social media uh, for some some good tips on this. But I think for employers, the thing that people um, are looking for most well, there's a couple of things. There's there's um, uh, visibility, um, having your supervisor, your team um, know that you're a caregiver. Uh, we know that one in four Canadians is, um, and uh, many, uh, many of us are working caregivers. Um, and so being acknowledged, um, knowing that you have that role and ideally having some flexibility um, with the understanding that you're going to do your best work, but you might need some flexible hours. Uh, you might need, there might need to be some policies that support you doing your best work. Um, also, um, counseling and employment uh, employee assistance programs, any kind of supports you can offer through health benefits um, that provide that caregiver with the opportunity to take care of their own mental health uh, is going to help them stay uh, doing their best work and, and um, be able to stay in the workplace um, through the ebbs and flows of, of their caregiving needs. Um, and, and also having um, really clear policies around leaves uh, because 
for some caregiving has episodic moments where you might need to take a leave and come back um, and being really clear uh, with uh, your uh, employees about um, how that works and, and what is available to them and what they can access. But I do think it all starts with communication and visibility, being able to share with your team and with your, your boss uh, and with your staff uh, what it is that's on your plate uh, when you're not sitting at your desk and, and many times when you are sitting at your desk um, really uh, is going to make the, the, the workplace um, uh, run more smoothly. And, you know, I can share all the data around lowering absenteeism and, and all that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, um, if you let people, if you ask people and let them share their needs with you uh, and uh, there's open communication, um, that then that is a workplace that's better for everybody including the employer thank you so much liz absolutely uh, i think you know communication um and uh and and uh, and supports uh through through workplace policy um is is uh and everything that you said is 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 absolutely spot on and um yeah especially about having those open lines of communication and feeling safe and and cared for it within the work within the workforce as well um terence did you have any uh, any thoughts of, uh, specifically about employer support well, everything that Liv, Liv had mentioned, um, having worked at different workplaces, uh, some have done like better than others in that regards. Um, and I feel like I've been very open about uh, having been and being a caregiver to my employers. And I've been yeah just really fortunate to have worked with some great teams and companies that, uh, including Brace Mobility, uh, that's super supportive in my, my, my caregiving. So. Yeah, I think I think the, the key is that to allow us as employees to feel safe to even like let our boss and supervisor and our team members know that this is what we're doing um, is like extreme importance. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that, that's that's been my that's been my experience so far. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Terrence. And, and then just fin finishing off with Helen, did you have any thoughts um, about employers and, and supports for caregivers? I do. I mean, there are in some instances, and I'm just really reflecting on my own situation where you just can't um, continue working for that employer, um, not because they haven't done a good job, but just the care responsibilities are um, such that you can't stay, which is what happened with me. I had a, quite a good job um, uh, and that I'd worked really hard to get. But uh, in the end, I had to step away from, from that job um, because my caregiving responsibilities wouldn't allow. And, uh, you know, that piece about our siblings aging and um, uh, there's just things that come up and, and uh, so working becomes really quite difficult. So there's some, you know, policy considerations needed around how people who can no longer work because they need to care. And most likely for siblings, that's actually their peak income earning years, um, how, how that imp impacts financial stability and financial security. So um, I guess that's again, speaking to that complexity piece around sibling caregiving, and uh, that needs most certainly some consideration in, in policy circles as well. Thank you, Helen. And oh, sorry, sorry, Liv. Did you want to Did you want to follow up at all? No, no. Uh, just okay. just really um, nodding along with um, the points, the points that Helen is making. And um, we need policy that supports people who aren't going to be able to work for for long periods of time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well. I just want to uh, say thank you to Terence, Liv, and Helen so much for such a rich conversation. Um, this has really shown and demonstrated the complexity of care within within our lives, within our experiences. I think that all of your um, your your very thoughtful um, and thought provoking answers surrounding care and policy really connects policy to people. It connects policy to care, um, and all aspects of 
um, of our lives, as well as um, as siblings who are caregivers, um, parents. Um, you've you've just done such a beautiful job of of, of opening up these uh, these relationships and these nuances and and complexities of the webs and circles of care. So, thank you all so much for such a wonderful uh, panel and dialogue discussion this afternoon. Um, and uh, and it was a real pleasure to be here with you all today. So thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having us.